Hey, what's going on, everybody? Sammy the Kim here, and I'm back with another one. Today, I will be talking about Montana spring game and my reaction about what took place and what I saw. I'll also be talking about Clifton McDowell's commitment. There was a lot that happened over the weekend about that, so we can talk about that. Um, Rashi Rice and his former teammate um, have been charged with a couple of charges. Unfortunate situation, but I'm going to speak about that. Um, a member of the Dartmouth basketball team uh, spoke out in opposition of their unionization. And I know I spoke about this a few weeks ago. So this is something that I really want to talk about and really want to address. I think what he said, first off, I mean, I know an editor probably. Anyway, we'll get into that. Um, I want to talk about, uh, so College Football Campus Tour is doing a um, top top stadium bracket. It's like, I think it's like the top 48 stadiums in FCS. I wanted to talk about my top five. Um not anybody, not influenced by anybody, just my personal top five, so I'll get into that. The FCS championship game is moving to a Monday, which I think could be great for viewership, could be great for fans. Um, I think it's going to plus plus the experience for everybody involved, so that will be amazing. Um, former Notre Dame quarterback Sam Hartman called NIL a slippery slope, also something I've been talking about, so we will get into that. And then the rule changes about transferring in the NCAA will be the last thing I'll address. Once again, didn't get any fan questions, but also didn't ask. I'm recording on Sunday today. Had to change the schedule up a little bit, but um, this will be how we'll do it going forward. Just let me know what you guys think about in the comments. We will get straight into the video. Make sure you hit the like, hit the subscribe. Always leave a comment for me. Let me know how you like this, and we will get straight into it. Okay, so Montana had their spring game on Friday, Friday night. Um, if you guys watch my vlog, I did the radio show with Coulter Regime, had um, personal things to take care of, so he wasn't able to attend, but I filled in for his place. Like I said, I mean, once again, Regime always, I mean, unfortunately, I got the opportunity from him, but, um, you know, he had things going on. The opportunity came my way. I feel like Regime's always somebody who's given me opportunities and things like um, last year, the DEI Summit that I, I attended um, in his place was amazing. Um, you know, he's always given me opportunities. Regime Seabrook, great guy in the city of Missoula, great guy for the community. If you guys don't know him, you need to meet him. He's an amazing person. Either way, I filled in for him with Coulter on Nuanez Now from 4 to 6 before the spring game took place. We talked about all things Big Sky, not even all things Big Sky, really all things Grizz and a lot of Bobcat football. Discussed a lot of that. I don't know if it's on playback, but you guys can probably go listen back to it. Um, yeah, it was a great time. The spring game was a great time. A lot of guys showed out. One thing I wanted to talk about is Coulter. Man, I've always talked about Coulter and how he always has a great mind for Big Sky football and particularly Grizz and Bobcat football. And uh, during the show, he had mentioned something about TJ Roush and was just like, um, I can't remember exactly what he had said, but he said like TJ Roush is somebody I expect, you know, he had watched him in high school and he was a really good receiver in high school at Sentinel, a really great athlete. TJ, I mean, if you see TJ right now, he's got the build, he's got the size. I mean, he looks like a D1 football player. I mean, he's a D1 football player. He's been a D1 football player, but like he fits the part 100% now. And uh, he had a really long pick six during the game. And I remember during the game, I texted, I texted Coulter and was like, man, like you called it. And like so many times last year, there would be things that happened in the big sky or things that happened with, you know, the Grizz or the Bobcats. And it would be something that Coulter had talked about either the week before or sometime during the season. And it ended up coming into fruition. So Coulter really knows what he's talking about when it comes to Grizz, Bobcat, big sky football. So make sure you guys tap into him on Nuan as now 102.9 ESPN, I believe is the channel that he is on. Um, big Sky Breakdown every week I appear on his show But he's he's a great resource Make sure you guys tap into him if you are not already But I just thought that was interesting TJ Roush was somebody I wanted to talk about today He's somebody who stood out to me I heard that he was running one reps In the um, all spring Because maybe Trevin was dealing with some injuries Or something like that But TJ Roush was running the one reps at corner Which was interesting because, I'm, because Well first off I'm pretty sure he came in as a receiver Because I think when I was a senior his first day, he was in the receiver room with us. And then I think, you know, or maybe his first day headed to the receiver room, they told him that he was going to defense. But he wasn't on the receiver side very long. He he got moved to defense. He's been at safety. Um, I know he's a really good athlete. I know um, he's a really smart kid. But he hasn't really got his opportunity to play. And seeing him on Saturday, first off, just how he looks. I mean, he looks big, strong, fast. He looks like he is ready to wreak havoc in the fall. And it I could not be more happy for him. Um, but he had a really long pick six during the game and it just, you know, typified what 
Cl what uh, Coulter had said about him, you know, he looks primed to have a great year. Um, I don't know if I'll go as far to say it, all Big Sky selection this year, but, um, you know, I think he's going to make some noise this year for sure. Um, I, I really do. Uh, he, 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 he wowed me on, on Friday and obviously it's a small sample size. I didn't go to, I didn't go to any spring ball practices. The spring game was my first time seeing a lot of those guys. Stevie Rocker Jr. The running back is somebody also who showed out to me. Um, man, it felt like he was running all over the place. I think he had a couple of touchdowns, um, uh, uh, some really long runs. I'm, I, I would go as far to say, I didn't really see a stat sheet or anything. I don't know if they do a, an official box score for spring games, but, um, I would go as far to say he was probably their leading rusher. He looked really, really good. A lot of size. He fits the part as well. Obviously, he's been at Arizona his whole career, so um, he 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 looks like he's ready to play as well. We got a stable of running backs back there. Obviously, X moving to slot receiver primarily, so I don't know if he'll still be playing a little bit of running back or not, but you know, X seems to really like slot receiver. When I talked to him last week, he said he really enjoys being a slot receiver. He's really excited for that opportunity. So, you know, we got Eli, who I don't think played at all. Or actually, Eli did play a little bit, but he didn't play a lot. Nick Osmo played a little bit. He played the first drive, but I don't think he played a lot. But then we got Stevie Rocker Jr., who got a lot of the, the reps at running back, and he looked really good. Really excited to see him. Another player who necessarily didn't shine for me, shine in the spring game. You know, I didn't really see him show it in the spring game, but I heard good things when I was talking to a lot of the players on the sidelines and, you know, conversing on the sidelines. Krishan Gordon, that was somebody who I had mentioned last week who I was really interested to see. Um, those defensive backs, TJ Roush, somebody who I didn't even mention I was interested to see last week and somebody who shined. So um, I said I was really interested to see how these DBs played out. Um, I think TJ Roush, obviously Trevin and um, RJ, I think will probably be the starters on the outside but you know TJ Roush being an athlete I don't know if they move him around on the defensive side of things obviously he knows the safety position but he looked really good at corner so I don't know how they'll, they'll work that out but it's, it's it's never a bad thing to have athletes on your defense you want as many athletes as you can on your defense especially the type of defense we run um, I'm sure they'll find a great role for TJ but Krishan Gordon somebody else I heard good things about he definitely fits the part he looks he looks the way you want your defensive backs to look. He has the, the moxie. He has it all. Looks great. I think our defense looks really good. I didn't really get a great look at the defensive line. They were getting a lot of pressure on the quarterback. So if that's any indication of how good or bad our defensive line will be, um, I think that's a good sign. That might be an indication of, you know, what our offensive line isn't. But also, I've heard great things about the offensive line. I talked to Coach Pease after the game. He ensured me that the quarterback and the offensive line position will be perfect. He thinks they're going to be amazing. Um, I don't know how the, the reps were working out for some of the guys on the offensive line. Um, I don't know if they had just all the ones in one group or if they even have set ones. You know, Coach Hawk doesn't really like to do that until the last minute. So um, we probably won't know what the starting offensive line or even the starting defensive line or defense will look like until late, late in training camp or during training camp. So, um Really, really liked what I saw. The quarterbacks, you know, I, I don't think they got a ton of time. Um, Ayat didn't play too much. Fife played quite a bit. Ayat didn't. I mean, Ayat played. Um, I didn't see him hit any big, deep passes. He, he seemed like he was under a little pressure, but he seemed cool in the pocket, as he usually does. Fife did a fine job. I mean, none of the quarterbacks really played particularly bad, but none of them really stood out. Caden Huat, honestly, the young guy who's been here for a few years, kind of stood out. Uh, made a really big pass to Aaron Aaron Fonts and a uh, really big completion, really great play, really great play for Aaron, but really great play for Caden Huop. I don't know where he is in the depth. I would honestly assume that he's probably around three or four in the depth, but you know, something could be going on. Honestly, I got the first reps and then we saw Fife next and then we saw Vidlak and then we saw Huot eventually. So, um, he looked good. I don't know, you know, what that did to help or hurt his standing on the roster or the depth chart, but um, I think he played well. I think he operated the offense fine, and I'll be interested to see how that turns out. There was also um, Gage Slitter from Kalispell threw a touchdown pass to Drew Klump, and man, it was a beautiful pass on Kenzel Lawler, the corner who I said I was interested in seeing. Um, Really good play by uh, Drew Klump. Really great over-the-shoulder catch. Really amazing pass from Drew Slitter. Um, Gage Slitter, not Drew. Drew Klump was this guy who caught the pass. But um, really great play. Amazing play by some of the young guys. And you know in the spring game, there's always going to be one, two, or three. Two or three young guys who show out. They get a lot of reps. I mean, honestly, they didn't get that many reps. But when they did get their reps, they showed out. There was also another young running back. Let me find him. Number 23, Bo. 
Um, all the Levi and Corbin, everybody on the sidelines, Braxton, they were singing his praises. He looked really good as well. Um, Asher Corey back at running back as well. I think, I mean, I didn't get to see him really that much. Well, actually he played a lot actually, now that I'm thinking about it, but everybody kind of did their own thing. Um, guys showed some of their strengths, some of their weaknesses. It was cool to see some of those young guys show out. Really cool to see TJ Roush get a really big play. Um, cool to see Caden Huat get an opportunity and, and make the most of it. He's been here for a couple of years. So maybe some of that development that he's been getting under coach Pease and previously under coach um, Rosie has started to pay off. And, you know, maybe that's somebody we could see rise up the depth chart during training camp. Maybe, you know, who knows? He's a homegrown guy out of Helena High, I believe. So it would be nice to see him, you know, show up and get an opportunity being that he's a homegrown guy. And, uh, you know, I think they were really high on him coming out of high school. So good to see him finally, you know, get the reins and uh, get the hang of things. But it was it was it was an exciting day. Young guys showed out per usual. They're going to get a lot of reps. Um, some of the running backs showed out. Like I said, um, Stevie Rocker Jr. showed out. TJ Roush, I keep mentioning it, showed out. Krishan Gordon heard good things about him. The D-line was getting pressure. So um, you guys can let me know in the comments what you thought about the spring game. I thought it was pretty exciting. Um Thought it gave us a little bit of what to expect going into fall camp and going into the fall. You guys let me know what your expectations are going into the fall after the spring game. You know, are you excited? Are you a little worried? What are your thoughts? Let me know in the comments and we will move on. Okay, probably the biggest news of the weekend was Clifton McDowell finally committed to McNeese State who went 1-10 last year. This is what I saw from Frank on X. They were 1-10 last year, and their one win came from forfeit. So hopefully he is looking to turn that around. I believe they play in the Southland Conference. So, um, you know, he has an opportunity coming from a team that played in the national championship last year. He had something, a lot to do with that. So um, they feel, feel pretty confident in bringing him in, and uh, they hope that he's able to turn the thing, turn things around for them coming into this year but um yeah i think it was a whirlwind man so first off uh, I, I i talked about it last week i thought he was coming back to montana uh the signs seemed to be pointing that he was going to be coming back to montana he had tweeted something kind of signaling that he may be coming back to montana you know some hourglasses on a previous tweet signaling like hey seems like he's coming back to montana well Maybe he didn't get a full ride scholarship. Maybe he didn't get the type of compensation that he was looking for in terms of scholarship money. And he went looking for other options. Well, later on in the week, it seemed that Prairie View A&M might have been where he was trying to go. Prairie View A&M, um, there was a report that came out through Sports Illustrated. I think it was um, HBCU Legends said that he had verbally committed there or soft committed there. And the coach had reported that. But uh, somebody was... Either, we're not going to get into that, but he had said he had committed. It, it had seemed like he had committed to Prairie View A&M. Well, I guess a day later, that wasn't so much true. Some of the statements in that article had been redacted and things had changed. Well, I believe it was Saturday, Saturday morning following Montana spring game. Clifton committed to McNeese. He posted on his Instagram and, in, you know, full McNeese gear and he had committed online. So it seems... I believe the transfer portal window doesn't even open until tomorrow on, well, tomorrow's technically Monday, but on Tuesday, April 16th, the portal window is when the portal window opens. And, uh, so I guess that's where he, he'll officially commit. And I guess the window doesn't, doesn't even close until maybe the 30th, like the end of April, but there's some time there, but it seems that he's going to McNeese State. So the Clifton McDowell transfer saga is finally over Montana to Temple Temple to back in the portal, Montana maybe, Prairie View a and maybe, back to McNeese State. Um, yeah, he's finally found a home. It's been a wild ride. It honestly has been a wild ride. But I think, you know, a lot of the comments that I were seeing, a lot of fans are more than happy for him. Obviously, there's some of those fans that are kind of bitter about the situation, not really happy. A lot of the fans, you know, poking fun at, you know, the amount of times he's moved around, which which I understand. But, you know, it is what it is. He's where he, he's at McNeese. Uh, it would be awesome if they, they were really good next year and made the playoffs. Um, I had a friend message me and say, like, could we meet them in the playoffs? And um, I don't 100% know, like, we assist, we could in theory meet them in the playoffs they weren't very good last year so i don't know like it changes from year to year so i don't want to say they're going to be bad this year they they can flip it around there's been teams that have been terrible one year and been great the next year so um i do hope they make the playoffs that would that would be great television 
if Clifton McDowell had to end up playing Montana in 2024, could you guys imagine? Could you imagine? That would be amazing. Now, we don't know if that'll happen. That's just speculation right now. Like, obviously, he said he's committing. So that's what we do know. But if we're if he's going to end up playing against Montana, that is way too far. There's there's way too much that has to happen for that to happen. So um, good luck to him. Very excited for him to see how he turns out. I know there'll be a lot of people that'll be tapped into that situation, paying attention to see how Clifton's season goes. Just because, you know, um, he was a Montana Grizz last year. And obviously, people want to know, like, was it just a fluke or was it for real? Um, I think he has a specific skill set. I think that skill set translates to any team as long as they know how to use him. So we will see. It's going to be an exciting 2024 season. Obviously, um, my focus is on the big sky and, and the Grizz and all the teams on this side. But I will keep an eye on Clifton McDowell. And, you know, I, I, I want to know how he does. I hope he does well. I, I hope he's able to turn that situation around. The Southland Conference is no slouch of a conference. But, um, you know, I think they can get over. I think, you know, with his skill set, I don't think the Southland Conference is the big sky. I'll say that. I think the Southland Conference is a formidable conference, but they're definitely not the big sky. So, um Good luck to him, man. I hope him all the best. I hope he's able to shine. I hope he's able to show out. And uh, yeah, man, good luck to you. And uh, sorry it couldn't work at Montana. Sorry we weren't able to get you back. Thought we were going to be able to get you back. I would have liked to see how that would have turned out. Maybe possibly running a two quarterback system here or, you know, maybe just going with him. I don't know. I don't know. We went to the national championship with him. So those are my thoughts on it. You know, I think he brings a specific skill set to the table. And if, if, coach Pease was able to make it work one year why not would he why wouldn't he be able to make it work this year that's not the case now he's at mcneese you guys can let me know in the comments what you think about that are you happy for him i think a majority of the fans are happy for him or let me know in the comments are you bitter do you feel some type of way about the way he's been moving out here that's your opinion i don't hold that type of bitterness towards him in my heart but um i wish him nothing but the best so you guys can let me know and we will move on Rashi Rice and his former teammate Teddy Knox were charged in a six car accident and Teddy Knox was recently suspended by SMU because of this situation. Um, I got to guess they're going to let this situation play out uh, before they decide if he's off the team or if he can come back to the team. I don't know if they set a time limit for a suspension, but he's suspended from the team right now. Rashi Rice, there's been nothing that's happened to him from the chief side of things. Usually in the NFL, they let situations like this play out before they, you know, um, make a determination. I'm sure the NFL will bring down um, some sort of discipline for him before the, the like the chiefs probably won't have to discipline him. It'll probably be the NFL. And if the case takes long enough, I'm sure the NFL I mean, I don't know if they would put him on the exempt list, but, you know, nobody was seriously injured in this situation. It's just the fact that, you know, they found some marijuana in the car. Um, you know, he 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 did flip, flip. He did leave the scene. So that doesn't look great. And leaving the scene on top of them finding marijuana in the car is not great. They just talked. They just um, posted his speed. I think it said he was going like 120 miles per hour, which is really fast, especially if you've ever driven on those Dallas highways, like five to six lane highways everybody drives fast in the first place so the fact that you're going 119 um it's it's a wonder that nobody was seriously injured thank god that nobody was seriously injured but um yeah it's just a, it's just a wild situation like my thing is like and you can feel how you want about like this is texas this is in the south texas is a red state um i don't think marijuana is legal in texas of at any extent i don't think it's medically uh legal or it's record i know it's not recreational legal i'm from oklahoma i think it's only medically legal in oklahoma but he got arrested or i mean he fled the scene my question would be like why would he leave that stuff in the car if he was fleeting f leaving the scene like i get that like possibly maybe he was under the influence so that would be reason for him to leave the scene but I understand that 100%. But if you're leaving the scene and you're under the influence, then why would you leave what possibly you might have been under the influence of in the car? Why not take that with you? Because, I mean, I, mean, I don't know. I don't know. It just kind of was puzzling to me. And also, they said they found a Chiefs playbook in the car. And at first, there was a lot of speculation. I know this was like a week or this happened like a couple weeks ago. But like there was speculation about like, was it Rashi Rice? I, they know for sure because him and his lawyer have come out now and said that, yes, he was involved and he he intends to cooperate. So um, all of that's good. But the situation's not great. But the fact that he left the playbook, it's like 
So they don't think they, they have speculation that it's you. They have speculation because of the car was leased under your name. They have speculation that you were driving it, but they find the playbook. It's like, there's no questions. Like, this is you, bro. This is you. Like, I don't know. I mean, I'm not, I'm not judging. I, I, I don't wish this situation on anybody. It's, it's a hard situation for him to deal with. You know, he just won the Super Bowl. He's probably feeling like he's on top of the world, had a pretty good rookie season. I believe he was a second round draft pick out of SMU, probably hanging out with his college college guys after a year in the league so it's like you know they probably hold him in high regard he's 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 on top of the world right now he's feeling really good and unfortunately got ahead of himself driving a little fast on the highway one guy bumped the other a couple cars got involved in an accident and then they leave so you know now this is going to be something that they're going to talk about outside of what you just did which is have a great rookie year and win the super bowl i mean not a lot of people can say they did that but now the topic of conversation is what happened and what took place um, in that car accident. Nobody wants to talk about your rookie season anymore. So um, I, I, I hope that they're able to get this situation figured out. I hope that um, he learns from this situation. I hope that he becomes better after this situation. I hope he, he uses this to teach some of the young guys coming up like, hey, I made this mistake. Please don't make this mistake. I know there's been plenty of NFL guys before him and there will be plenty of NFL guys after him that are preaching this same message, but he can now be an advocate if he wants to be an advocate for guys coming, young guys coming into the league, and you know, it might be too early for me to say this, but he could be an advocate for these guys to show them, you know, hopefully he's able to bounce back from this and have an amazing career. I think he will have an amazing career. He has a great skill set. Um, seems like he's a great player. Seems like he's a good teammate. But um, you know, hopefully he's able to bounce back from this and and be better for it. And hopefully maybe he can become an advocate for young guys coming to the league to tell them like, hey, look. I did this and, you know, you don't need to go down that path. I feel like we've seen so many guys in the coming in the league, you know, getting into car accidents or having some issue with a car. The unfortunate situation with Henry Ruggs where he was driving like 150 miles per hour in Vegas. You had the situation with Jalen Carter. You got this situation with Rashi Rice. I, I think there was just a, recently a situation with Deontay Johnson uh, maybe a year ago or, you know, they had the Jordan Addison situation where he got the speeding ticket just – so many guys, they get this money, they get these fast cars, they get they get in these these at these these situations that they've probably never been in, in their whole entire life, and probably just want to see how fast the car goes. And one thing turns into another. Thank God nobody was seriously injured. Like I said, um, I'm poking fun, but it is a very situ serious situation, and I hope he's able to learn from this and improve. You guys, let me know what you thought about this situation. Um, have you even heard about this? Do you even care about it? Or what are your thoughts about it? And we're going to move on. Okay, so a couple of weeks ago, first off, a member of Dartmouth's men's basketball team speaks out in opposition to unionization. Now, this is something that I spoke about a couple of weeks ago when the 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 uh, the ruling came down that they were going to be able to unionize. Now, he he um, spoke out in an article, um, speaks out in opposition to you today. He spoke out in an article, and I'm going to read some of the quotes from the article, and then I'll discuss it. Responding to the men's basketball team decision to unionize, Connor Christensen of the class of 25, 2025 provides an alternative viewpoint. Quote, not all players on the Dartmouth men's basketball team support the strategy of unionization to push for compensation and other benefits. Part of what makes a Dartmouth education singular is the opportunity it presents to engage with opinions and ideas that are new foreign and contradict your own. I believe that the movement opposes the core values and traditions of Dartmouth's athletics. The balance between a rich academic history and competitive athletics and may lead to unintending consequences for athletes across the college. Given the various levels of sport and the diversity of programs under the college's umbrella, I believe unionization would be undesirable and inadequate fit that fails to bring about positive benefits for most athletes at Dartmouth. Now, this is something I spoke about. This obviously, you know, this, I mean, I didn't so much speak about a player opposing to it because I didn't think, I thought if the whole basketball team was fighting for that, that was something that they all wanted. I think that might be why Connor Christensen is coming out and saying this now is like, even though we won that case, this might not be something that everybody wanted to get out of this like not everybody was you know is looking for conversation and some of us are just happy with getting an education and that is something that i don't think a lot of people are talking about in the nil landscape and like with all these kids getting money um 
I, I think the conversation, and I've spoke about it multiple times, I'll be the first one to throw my hands up and say, I've said like, a lot of these kids are searching for the biggest dollar amount. A lot of these kids are searching for the perfect situation where you get the right amount of money, but also you get the right amount of playing time. Um, some kids might not care about any of that. Some kids might just be in college to get an education, to play the sport they love, and you know, to, to take their life to the next level. Now, some may say like, the kids that feel like that aren't the kids that are really have an opportunity to benefit in the first place. Like they weren't going to make any money anyway. So why would they be chasing dollar amounts? Why would they care about unionization? Why would they care about NIL? That's fair. But there also is this part of the population of kids in college athletics that, you know, simply enjoy college athletics for what they are, which is a chance to further their athletics career and a chance to, you know, build long lasting friendships, a chance to um, get a great college education, especially at Dartmouth and Ivy League school. You're getting an amazing education. Um, and that's kind of what he spoke about in this article was like, we have an opportunity to get a, an amazing education at one of the most historic universities in the country. Like, why do we need why does it have to why does money have to become a thing? Like, that's not something I wanted. That's not something I really uh, am for. Obviously, I'm going to stand by my brothers and stand by my team. He mentioned at the end of the article, like, I'm not going to leave the team or anything. I just wanted to let the world know that, like, not everybody is for this unionization. And he also points to how this could affect other, you know, other athletic um, teams on the campus. He goes on to say, while basketball and football are revenue driving sports for many teams in the NCAA, athletic programs at Dartmouth are not known for generating revenue. My team's decision may, therefore, yield undesirable consequences if unionization becomes widespread. As many have noted, non-revenue producing sports programs at the college at the college may be forced to reckon with program and budget cuts. And that's something I talked about. So now that these kids are essentially becoming employees you're becoming employees well now that means you become somebody who who you become an employee if every if this is the precedent that's being set for this university i don't know if it'll be set for every university but if this is the precedent that's being set for the dartmouth university of dartmouth what does that do for all the other programs what does that mean does title nine still is title nine still a thing because Title IX is something that balances the powers and balances the amount of scholarships between men's athletes, excuse me, and women's athletes on a given university's campus. Well, if that is not in effect anymore, how does that affect, you know, scholarships that are given to women athletes? How does that affect the amount of teams on a campus? Like he talks about budget cuts, program cuts. Like, is that something that would be coming down the line if this is now the precedent that, that's being set? An additional concern is how Dartmouth will comply with Title IX if only one side of a sports program can collectively bargain with the college. Exactly. If only one team of the whole college athletics department is bargaining for themselves, does that then affect some of these other programs? Does that... I don't know what the ramifications of this are. Like, I, I'm not big into NCAA politics or, like university politics athletic department politics but like had it, i know it will have an effect the the question i think connor christensen is asking and the question i've been asking is what is that effect how will that affect title nine i've mentioned this on multiple occasions i think it 100 percent is going to have an effect on title nine what is that effect going to be he's posing that question that i basically posed a couple of weeks ago like what is the effects how does this affect this is a precedent and obviously it's good for those athletes on the basketball team obviously this gives them an opportunity to argue for protections that they feel they need but you know what is the long-term effects of the the college and its athletic department overall when all of this is said and done ultimately unions exist to protect people from being taken advantage of i however do not feel exploited by Dartmouth. It is an honor to represent the college and attend an institution with world-class academics and prestige. So he's speaking of like, basically the basketball team at Dartmouth unionized because essentially probably some of those players on that team felt like they were being taken advantage of by the athletic department, by the NCAA. So they want an opportunity to be able to argue and bargain for things that they feel like they, they rightfully deserve, which is fair. That's what unions are made for. They, the, the, the courts ruled that they are entitled to form a union. So that is what it is. But I'm sure Connor Christensen, I mean, basketball teams are kind of small, but I'm sure, you know, he may be the only one, but I'm sure he's not the only one that's thinking like, Hey, like, 
I don't feel taken care of. I don't feel taken advantage of. I go to one of the best universities in America. I'm getting a great education. I get to play college basketball. Obviously, they don't have scholarships at Ivy League schools, so that may be something that these Dartmouth players are forming a union for because it's like we're on academic scholarships where we're student athletes you know we do more than a lot of these regular students but we're only entitled to the same scholarships as some of these regular students i mean i don't know how the scholarship structure works at um ivy league schools i believe like when a kid gets a full ride scholarship for like if he's a football player he gets a scholarship but it's an academic scholarship it's not an athletic scholarship i don't think they give athletic scholarships at ivy league schools I don't know why they do that. That also may be why kids can only go four years at an Ivy League school. That's why a lot of them grad transfer out after their fourth year to go somewhere else and play. Um, there's a lot that goes into it. I don't know 100% why they felt they needed to form the union. Obviously, they felt like they were being taken advantage of in some form or fashion. But I feel like the, the bigger point that I'm trying to make is this is something that I mentioned. This is something that I talked about as to something that could affect Title IX at Dartmouth and something that could affect Title IX in college going forward. If this becomes the precedent at a lot of schools, Title IX becomes obsolete. Title IX becomes a question. You have to start questioning Title IX and a lot of kids are going to lose out on opportunities. Um, I'm not going to belabor this point anymore, but you guys let me know what you thought about that, what you think about that in the comments. Um, do you agree with what Connor Christensen is saying or do you think that, uh, I mean, obviously, like I said, he doesn't feel like He's not going to leave the team. He's not going to take, he's not going to like protest the team or the union or anything like that. I think he more so just felt like getting the word out to the world. Like, yes, we won that court ruling. Yes, we are able to form a union, but this is not necessarily a united, like not everybody was for this idea. You know, he's just trying to let everybody know that some of us still do go to Dartmouth for the love of Dartmouth, the education, for the love of also the athletics that we are, that we get to play. Um, some of us are, aren't feeling taken advantage of and he mentioned that so you guys let me know what your comments are and we will move on so today is sunday um college football campus tour has been doing a, a top 48 stadiums in uh fcs football i don't have the entire bracket on here probably should put it on there i don't really i mean the bracket is amazing i think walgers is gonna win there's a couple finalists you got like uh sdsu stadium i think it's jay dykehouse stadium is one of the final there's like a top eight now um, Wild Grizz is obviously one of them. The Kibbe Dome, you have NAU in there. I think I saw Jackson State in there. Um, but there's some really good schools in there. We've been seeing some amazing campuses. If you guys haven't seen his bracket, go check that out. It's amazing. Um, by the time this drops on Tuesday, it might be finished at that time. But it's been an amazing bracket. It's been amazing to watch. Hopefully the championship is by that time at that point. But I'm predicting that it will probably be Washington Grizzly versus the Kibbe Dome. They're on opposite sides of the bracket. Maybe NAU. Uh, I think the Fargo Dome is in there as well. They might know the Fargo Dome got beat by the Kibbe Dome, actually, which um, I think that was a pretty close one. But uh, I, I, I voted on the I voted on the Kibbe Dome. So, um, yeah, have you guys been tapping in this? Leave me a comment. But I'm going to give you guys a top my top five FCS stadiums that I believe are are the top five in FCS football. This is my personal top five, not influenced by anybody. I revised this myself. I didn't speak to anybody on this, and I don't really care what you guys think about it, but you guys can let me know your comments. I love to see you hate on my top five. I'd love to see you if you love my top five. I, I love it all. Either way, my number one, you know what my number one is going to be. I believe it is the undisputed best stadium in college football, bar none, you, like, I think you can put up some arguments for one or two stadiums, but I don't think there's much debate about what the number one stadium in FCS football and probably a top 10, 15 in all of college football. Just the environment, the, the crowd noise, the stadium makeup, just everything about it is amazing. If you've never seen a game at Washington Grizzly Stadium in Montana, you need to. That is my number one stadium in FCS football. It's amazing. Um... It's amazing. I, I can't say enough. If you've never seen a game in Washington Grizzly, especially in 2023, that was a year to see some amazing games. Furman, amazing. Cat Grizz, amazing. NDSU in the semifinals, amazing. Just some great games in that stadium. There's been some great times being had, and there will be more great times being had in 2024. So if you haven't got out for a game in Washington Grizzly, please do. My number two stadium, I've never seen a game here. I've actually never seen an HBCU football game, but I, I, I see them pack out their stadium. It looks like an, a beautiful, amazing stadium. The university, is it university? No, Jackson State University. Jackson State University, number two on my list. Great stadium. Deion Sanders kind of, I think they were already pretty prominent in terms of 
fan uh fan appreciation and fan support with fans showing up to the games but i think Deion sanders had something to do to elevate that a little bit maybe not but um Jackson State, they pack out their stadium regularly. They're usually the number one school in FCS football in attendance. Um, I got to get out to a game out there. Me and my friend Zoe were honestly just talking about um, the Celebration Bowl that happens in Atlanta. I would love to go to the Celebration Bowl. That that would be a great time, a great celebration, great situation to be in. But um, Jackson State, my number two. Number three on my list is the Kibbe Dome. Now, um, I've played, I think, twice in the Kibbe Dome. It's an amazing stadium. The lights are amazing. Um, a little bit of older, an older um, dome. I really don't know. Can somebody let me know in the comments what, like, it's, it's seen as a legendary college football venue. Where did that spark from? I need to know. I need answers. Because, like, I get that so many people rave about the Kibbe Dome. And it is an awesome place to play. It's an amazing stadium. It gets really loud when they pack it out. Um, you know, Idaho's got some history to them. Montana has the Little Brown Stein right now. So, you know, and we don't play this year. So, I don't know when you guys will see it next. But hopefully you guys can get it back. Not Actually, no, nah, I don't hope you guys get it back. I hope we have it forever. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Either way, that's my number three stadium. But somebody let me know in the comments, like, what is the allure about the Kibbe Dome? I don't get it. I've never understood it. I've never understood why people rave about it so much. It, I do think it is an amazing stadium. Obviously, I'm putting it at my number three. I think it's an awesome venue. But, like, I don't get the history behind it. I don't get why so many people are so high on it. Um, it, it like I said, it's an awesome stadium, but I don't get the allure. You guys can let me know in the comments. That's my number three. My number four, never played here, never been here, but the Fargo Dome. Fargo Dome is an amazing stadium. Obviously, I said in college football campus tours, they lost. They went up against, you know, sometimes that's how playoff brackets work. Sometimes a team might be like a top five, a top three team, but they just go against a better opponent. You know, like if NDSU, talking about football, talking about the games now, if NDSU wouldn't have gone against Montana, they probably wouldn't have went to the national championship. But they ran into a dog and, and the Grizzlies. So, you know, things happen. Things happen. Either way... The Fargo Dome, I've never played there, but um, looks like a great venue. All the pictures are amazing. They always pack it out. Um, I'm not, I, I mean, I honestly like the yellow and green colors, except for when they're going against my maroon and silver. Um, I, I don't think the yellow and green colors are, are as a bad colorway. I honestly like the NDSU colorway. Um, but their stadium looks amazing. I'm unfortunate. I unfortunately never got to play there. Hopefully I'm able to see a game there someday. But um, they have an amazing venue, and that would be my number four stadium. Now, number five. I reluctantly put them on here, but one thing I take into account when I think about um, best stadiums and best venues to play in, I think about the crowd, and these people always have a great crowd, and especially when we go there, it's always loud. I think you guys know what I'm going to say. Bobcat Stadium, it, it, it's not anything close to Wad Grizz. Don't get me, don't get confused with that. It's nothing close to Wad Grizz, but it is a great venue to play college football. Um, they get really loud. They pack the stadium out. Uh, it, it's a great college venue. It's a great college venue. Um, Montana fans don't have any professional teams to root for. They have the Bobcats and they have the Grizzlies. So those, those games are always amazing to go to. That's why one of the reasons it's great to play college football in Montana, they don't have anything else but their Bobcats and their Grizzlies. So you pick a side and you go support them with everything you have. It's an amazing place to play football. Obviously, when every time I've been there, with it's been aggression towards us. Um, you know, fans don't really like to see us. You're getting booed. But that is the environment that real competitors love to play in when, when you're not the the friendly guy when when you know you can disappoint those fans i love to see i never went there and disappointed them i never won it at, at bozeman stadium i can actually remember the last time the grizz probably like 2015 that the grizz last won in uh bobcat stadium but um yeah it's a great venue they pack it out they get really loud um i think it's hard to win there ndsu won there last year i don't know who else won there last year but it's a great venue great place to play football i i mean obviously it's not wild grizz let me emphasize that again it is not Wa Grizz, but it's a great place for football. That's my number five. Those are my personal top five stadiums in FCS football, my personal top five venues. Um, a couple of those I never played in, like Fargo and Jackson State, but great places to play college football, great places to have a game at. Hopefully I can get out to all of those, but um, eventually sometime. But you guys let me know maybe what your top five is in the comments or what you thought about my top five. We are going to move on. All right. So this is something that I know a lot of people are very excited about in college football. The FCS championship is moving to Monday night. Well, 
the new college football playoff rules just went into effect. So that'll probably push the championship game back. That's why this Monday slot is now open. No more competing on Sundays with NFL football for the FCS. This is going to be amazing. And it's Monday night. Oh, yeah, but it's this, it's, it's in uh, January. So there's probably no Monday night football. I, I don't think there should be Monday night football then. But that becomes the next question. Is it Monday night football? Because it's going to be, I think they said Saturday, that, that Monday night is when the game is going to be. Either way, this is a great opportunity. It's going to lengthen the weekend for the fans of championship weekend. You know, it's going to be on ESPN, not on ABC. So that's another plus in Frisco, Toyota Stadium, January 6th, 2025. Hopefully my Grizzlies are there. Hopefully a Big Sky team is there. I'll be covering the Big Sky this year. But, you know, it's going to be amazing. I think this just makes the weekend that much better um i think it makes it better for fans i saw somebody mention that it makes it better for fan traveling i think that's another plus you know travel on weekends is much more expensive than it is on a weekday so hopefully that'll lessen some of the flight prices um i, I think it's a plus for it's a plus 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 for everybody involved um I, honestly i don't know too much what to think about it because i haven't been involved with like fcs championship weekend that much i wasn't able to make it out for the grizzlies this past season for their championship weekend so um i don't know too much about you know what things are like in frisco and i obviously i've spent a ton of time i'm from oklahoma so i've spent a ton of time in dallas and the frisco area my dad lived in frisco two of my sisters are from dallas so like i've spent time out there but never for fcs reasons so um i'm excited you know i believe i'll have an opportunity to go to the championship game whether the grizzlies are in it or not this year so i'm pretty excited about that but um yeah you guys can let me know in the comments what you think about this do you guys think this is amazing do you guys think this is a, a good change for college football or does this you know is it whatever you know i think most of the people who i saw commenting on it on on twitter when the fcs announced it was like people are elated about this change people are really excited about this people think it's going to be really exciting obviously most of the blue blood fans are the only ones really talking about it like the ndsu fans the south dakota state fans the montana fans I, I i honestly see a lot of ndsu and south dakota state fans kind of saying that them meeting in frisco this year is going to be you know the marker game too i think that's what they call their rivalry game is the marker but um they're saying that that's they're, they're gonna they're gonna get to play twice next year once in the regular season and then once in you know the championship game so um Hopefully somebody's able to prove them wrong. I've been somebody who said NDSU is going to be a very formidable opponent this year. I don't think they're going to be any slouch. Cam Miller. Also, I want to correct something that I've been saying. Cam Miller is not the quarterback who transferred from South Carolina. It was, I think it's, uh, I was talking to Coulter about it. I think it was their backup. I remember they had somebody who transferred from South Carolina. I think it might've been their backup quarterback. Maybe at that time. I, I don't know. But Cam Miller won a championship as a true freshman. So let me correct that before I, I go any further either way though they keep saying ndsu and south dakota state are going to go to the national championship i, I don't 100 percent discount that i think north dakota state is going to be very good this year i think south dakota state's going to be pretty good this year too i think north dakota state's going to be the team to beat in the missouri valley but um we will see you know those are two really good programs who run their programs great who, who, who have figured it out recruiting wise who have all the pieces coming in every year um, north dakota state has a lot of seniors returning um either way we're talking about the championship game being on monday night i think it's going to be amazing i don't know who will be meeting on that monday night we will find out when the season starts to play itself out but you guys let me know in the comments what you think about the fcs championship game getting moved to a saturday do you think it's a plus do you think it's a negative i think most people think it's a plus but if you disagree with it let me know in the comments and we can move on former Notre, Notre dame quarterback sam hartman calls nil a slippery slope cautions college football players got a couple quotes there are certain circumstances where it's used really well and then sometimes i think it's just misconstrued for guys to kind of jump ship and say hey there's a little bit of money getting flashed at me right here i'm going to go do this and then that money's not as much as some people might think it might be this is something i've talked about guys jumping in the portal thinking that hey i can go get some money over here and i and i love to i, I want to caution all the fans because all the fans are always talking about all the money these guys are getting and i talk a lot about fcs football i love fcs football that's where i made my name is fcs football um there is not a lot of nil money at this fc at the fcs level so you may think a lot of these guys are getting a lot of money and even at the fbs level i think a lot of fans think that a lot of these guys are getting a bunch of money at the fbs level and, and it's really not like that you know i think people are confused about what is really going on out here with some of this nil money these guys 
are probably getting a little bit of money. And most of these guys that you think are getting money are probably getting money. But the amount that you think they're getting is probably incorrect. Now, um, Sam Hartman is somebody who did transfer from Wake Forest and went to Notre Dame. And in the article, they spoke about how he got a lot of uh, NIL deals with like Google, I think Beats by Dre. Um, he, he got a couple of he got a couple of NIL deals, but um, he, he he's not hurting at all. And he's now trying to take his talents to the NFL, uh, probably be a late round draft pick, probably be somebody that gets picked up for sure. But um, another quote. As leaders in the locker room and at Wake Forest and Notre Dame, it was like, guys, the only way this falls apart is people start pocket watch, park, start pocket watching, and start wondering why is this guy making this and I'm making that, and it happens naturally. But if it's something that's in the dark corners, that's life. But as soon as it becomes the main focus and football is not, then that's when you struggle, 100%. And that is what these kids have to focus on: keep the main thing, the main thing. Football is what made you that name. Football is what's going to make you a name if you have the talent to do that. So focus on the game and the game will always reward you. You know, don't put getting these NIL deals first. Don't put getting, you know, whatever it is out there for you. Don't put that first. Put the game first and the game will always give back to you. Always give back to you. Um, And I think that's what Sam Hartman's trying to say is like, you know, Although NIL is needed, although it's necessary, it's a slippery slope for some of these guys. You know, um, some of these guys start to leave these schools looking for this money and end up in a situation that is not advantageous for them. And also, you know, like they get promised this money in the recruitment process. And the next thing you know, you're at this school and that money's nowhere to be found. Or like, you know, a situation was promised to you. Maybe you do get the money and, you know, maybe playing time was also promised to you. But then, you know, you get on the field and honestly, the coaches don't like what they see or you're not the person that you're not the player that they thought you were. And then the playing time's not there. So then potentially those NIL deals may not be there. I don't know. You know, um, I think things may look very enticing to a lot of these kids from on the outside looking in and especially from the fans. Um, things look very enticing, but I don't think everything is as it seems. And I think that's what Sam Hartling's partly trying to say, but he's also partly trying to caution some of these players to just like, you know, keep the main thing, the main thing. Football is what's going to make you a name. Football is what's going to make you money. If you're good enough in football, the NFL will find you and pay you. The UFL is there as well. You can make money playing in the UFL as well. Like, Focus on the game and the game will reward you and those NIL deals will come. That money, those endorsement deals will come eventually. You know, if you're good enough, if you're a good enough person, if you have good character, you know, there are businesses in that town that are going to find you and want you to to be an ambassador for their brand and are going to be willing to put an amount of money in your pocket to do so. So um, Sam Hartman is really just trying to talk about how it's, it's a slippery slope and, you know, these guys looking at this money, you know, could could lead to trouble in the locker room, you know, guys trying to start in a pocket watch, like maybe a freshman, a five-star freshman comes in. And this is something I saw, um, who was it? Romo Dunes, they talk about like, you know, some of these guys who have been fifth year, six year seniors who have been working their butt off from a walk on to now getting a scholarship and have worked their butt to make their name, make a name for themselves. Maybe they're getting a little bit of NIL money, or maybe they're not getting any NIL money. And then they see this freshman who hasn't done anything, who hasn't proved anything, who hasn't sweat a lick in this locker room, who hasn't done one lift with us, is getting 100, 200,000, 300,000 in NIL deals because of who he is in high school. That's cool. And I think that's also what Sam Hartman's trying to say is like, that's cool what you did in high school. I'm glad you're a five-star coming in. But like, this is college. This is not high school. I don't care what you did in high school. And that is something that I've talked about that I came into college realizing. It's like, you know, yes, you were the man at your high school. And like, I wouldn't even necessarily say I was the man at my high school because my high school stats were nothing crazy. I was like a two-star recruit. You know, my brother was a four-star. That's why I think I was a two-star recruit. So I didn't come in with any like, you know, type of cachet, but I was a cocky kid. You know, I was very confident in my abilities and who I was as a football player. And, you know, I, I, I spoke about it as a freshman and they let me know fast we don't give a damn what you did in high school we don't give a damn who you were at your high school we don't give a damn what you've done before you got here because we haven't seen you do anything so you know coming in keeping your head down and proving yourself is going to be the number one importance 
of these kids. Just prove yourselves and keep the main thing the main thing. Also, if you're one of these kids getting these exorbitant NIL deals, don't come in being disrespectful to the guys who have been there before you because there are a lot of guys who will have been there longer than you, putting in work there longer than you, who are not getting the NIL deals that you're getting. So don't be disrespectful to the work that they put in or to who they are and what they mean to the universities because um, that's number one way to make you know enemies on campus. You know, come in, you got these NIL deals, you haven't even done anything on campus and, you know, you're talking crazy and, you know, trying to, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know. I haven't been really been in a situation like that. NIL was just passed when I was in my senior year of college. So, you know, I don't know too much about what's going on out here, but, you know, uh, just be vigilant kids and, and, and be aware of, you know, the money that you're getting, but also don't let it go to your head. So, um, you guys can let me know what you think about what Sam Hartman said. Do you guys think NIL is a slippery slope as well? I think, you know, everybody can say that NIL is a slippery slope, but what are you guys' thoughts about this in the comments? And we will move on. Hey. Last thing I want to talk about today is the NCAA discusses rule change to allow unlimited transfers without sitting out. Now, this is a rule that we've kind of seen play out this year in the this offseason with NCAA football because they passed a rule where from the 23 to 2024 football season, Guys who transfer don't have to sit out a year going into the 2024, 2025 season. So that's why we've seen a lot of these guys transfer back and forth. A lot of these guys go from one school to the other school because they don't have to. There's no waiver. There's no process for sitting out or anything like that. This is something that we saw happen to Tez Walker at Northern Carolina. He basically didn't play a majority of the season because of a waiver that didn't go through. Um, he transferred. I can't remember where he transferred from, but he transferred to North Carolina. And he basically, he's a really, really good receiver, but he didn't really get to play a lot this year because of the waiver process. And it was something um, the head coach, gosh, Mac, I'm, I'm, I'm blanking on his Mac Brown, was really um, upset about. And he spoke out about multiple times. For some reason, the NCAA wouldn't accept his waiver. And then eventually they, they I think they appealed it and eventually it went through like maybe midway late a little past midway through the season he ended up playing and he played really well but you know just a difficult situation from that standpoint nicole arbach of the athletic reported monday that the ncaa's division one council will consider proposed legislation that would remove limits for the number of times an athlete can transfer the legislation which the council can adopt at its april 17th through 18th meeting so that's you know this week um, would also allow athletes to transfer and play immediately if they are academically eligible. While athletes would, wouldn't have a limit of the number of times they could transfer, they could not transfer during an ongoing season and play for a second school during that same campaign. So they are able to transfer whenever uh, and, and play automatic play immediately unless they transfer during the same season. So say, you know, the 2024 season, somebody, you know, things are going the way you want. Maybe, you know, you have a disagreement with your coach or something's going on at that university. You transfer to a new school. You can transfer during the season, but you can't play for that school during the season. So you can transfer and you can be enrolled in all of that stuff, but, you know, you can't play, which I think is fair. And that's something that I had mentioned a couple weeks ago is like, now that these kids can transfer, you know, from the 2023, 2024 season to the 2024, 2025, season does that mean they can transfer in the same season and play in the same season no it doesn't it just means that this would take away the waiver process for kids transferring so yes you know kids can transfer whenever wherever how many times they want to transfer there would be no limit on transferring because i do remember there was this illinois tight end who um i can't remember where he had transferred from but he had transferred to illinois i believe to be closer to his grandmother and they ended up not uh, accepting his waiver and he had a real he had a real genuine reason why he wanted to transfer and the, and this is why people are not so much for the NCAA because for things like this like they have wacky rules in place in the first place amateurism was a wacky rule name image and likeness being being for forbidden was already a wacky rule with all the other rules that are wacky in the NCAA. But then here you are, you have this waiver process and it's in place for guys like this who want to transfer for a family reason. I want to be closer to my grandmother who's sick, who I believe she might've been dying, but you know, she was sick. She wasn't doing well. And he wanted to go to this school so that one, he could continue his academic and college football career, but also so that he could be closer to his family. The NCAA said, we don't care. You can't play this year. And, and, and that's why people are like, why are you like this? Like, you exist to, for the best 
the betterment of the players. You exist for the best interest of the players and the athletes at these universities. And sometimes with some of these rules, some of these things that you do, you don't look out for the best interest of the athletes. So um, that was an interesting situation that I thought took place. I think they're trying to look at the Tez Walker situation where he wasn't able to play for a whole year, which basically, you know, ruined his senior season. Um, who knows how NC NC uh, Northern Carolina would have, would have, um, performed if he would have been able to play the whole year i think they were still pretty good last year they didn't win the acc or anything but you know they were still pretty good either way um what do you guys think about this i think it's 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 interesting um i don't think it's a bad thing i think it's a good thing ultimately but you know i think we could see i mean we already see kids jumping from school to school to school to school um without you know i i don't think most kids have had to fill out a waiver when they transfer anyway and there's i mean I don't know how many waivers Clifton McDowell had to fill out to play at any of the schools that he played at, but he's transferred a bunch of times and I don't think he's ever had to, you know, fill out a waiver. So um, I think it's a very interesting situation. Um, I think we'll see more transfers. We already see the transfer portal has already been revolutionized and these guys go everywhere. Um, there's more transfers in the portal every year, I think. But um, you guys let me know what you think about this. Uh, I think it's I think it's good, but I think like Sam Hartman was talking about in my previous topic, it's a slippery slope. So we'll see how this plays out in the next year. Um, we'll see how this plays on the next couple years. But yeah, you guys can let me know in the comments what you think about that. Okay, that is going to conclude my video today. I appreciate you guys for tapping in. Make sure you guys leave a comment and let me know what you guys thought about all of the things I covered today. Let me know um, if there's anything you guys want me to cover in the future. If there's any breakdowns that you guys would like me to do. Still dropping breakdowns every week. So let me know what you guys think about that. But I appreciate you guys for tapping in. Make sure you hit the like Hit the subscribe button. Subscribe, subscribe, subscribe. Like the video, please. I appreciate you guys, and I will catch you guys next week. See ya.